We resume our lecture on the meninges. In this lecture, we'll be looking at a lot of clinicals. Now, what you're seeing in front of you is a CT scan of the head. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar, unlike an X-ray, which is just a plain view of the bony structures, a CT scan takes sections of the entirety of the thing that you're scanning. In this case, the head and neck. And you can see slices of each part of the head from top to bottom. And we're looking at it from the bottom side, meaning this is the left side and this is the right side. So if I were to start from the top, here you can appreciate the eyeballs, the nose, the nasal cavity, the maxillary sinus over here, the vertebra at the back. As I keep going down, a lot of the bony structures become much more clearer. And here I'm actually going towards the brain portion. You can see the frontal lobe, the temporal lobe, the ospital lobe back here. Actually, this is the cerebellum and the ospital is shrouded by it. As I go upwards more, then you can actually see the ospital lobe. Now, oh, some of you who are quick to pick this up may have noticed a difference between the right and left side. Notice over here, you can see a sharp demarcation and an area which is not present on the other side. This lens shaped structure which is concave inwards and convex outwards, is actually a subdural hematoma. And we did the dura mater yesterday. We did not uh, look at the vessels which are supplying the dura mater. One vessel which lies between the, between the two layers of the dura mater, the meningeal layer and the periosteal layer, is the middle meningeal artery. Now, I'll show you in the next 3D model how that, when that artery ruptures, you get an epidural hematoma. And in contrast to that, since this is a subdural hematoma, how this is formed by the rupturing of the cerebellar veins. Now, please see the next image that I'm about to share. Now you can see here the difference between an epidural hematoma and a subdural hematoma. As I mentioned, that the epidural hematoma must occur has to occur due to the uh, lesion of the middle meningeal artery and this is happening outside of the middle um, uh, the meningeal part of the dura mater and the appearance is actually convex inwards and because of the presence of the skull outside it won't expand on the out it'll actually push towards the inside hence the convexity towards the inside and this usually happens due to the lesion at the area known as the terion, which I'll show next. It's the landmark on your skull. Any sort of direct impact there has a chance to rupture that artery and give this hematoma. How would this question come up in your exam? The classical presentation is a person injures his head and he goes unconscious. He wakes up after a while, but then after minutes to maybe third, half an hour, he falls unconscious again. This lucid interval is characteristic of epidural hematoma. And in contrast, the subdural hematoma is actually within the dura mater, the periosteal part, and as well as the meningeal, and, but above the arachnoid. And due to the lesion of the cerebral veins, how are they uh, affected? It can happen due to uh, sudden movements of the head or concussions. They can rupture. This can cause bleeding of the venous blood. And this one will give a concavity towards the inside. Now, having that said, these two hematomas are obviously managed differently. And on the CT, I've already shown you the subdural hematoma. But now let's look at the anatomical area itself. For that, let us go over here. And let us look at the structure as well as the vessels. Now in front of you, you see the lateral view of the skull and the arteries here. The one on the outside you're seeing is actually the external carotid and all of its branches, superficial temporal and even the facial. And the one on going on the inside is the internal carotid. The middle meningeal artery is actually a branch of the maxillary artery. To, let's focus on the maxillary artery then for that. I'll have to zoom right over here. There we go. Here's a superficial temporal and right over here. I'm going to zoom in here. Where the external carotid bifurcates into superficial temporal, 
and then the other one is your maxillary here we go you can see how the maxillary is crossing inside uh, within the mandible the ramus of the mandible as well as the condyloid and the coronoid process one of its branches will ascend upwards and pass into the foramen spinosum let's just move this much better here you can see a very nice maxillary artery and here is the middle meningeal ascending upwards to give a better view let's go up on the top and I will remove one portion of the skull just to show how it appears here we go now you can see two foramenas here foramen ovale and foramen spinosum it is from the foramen spinosum that we have the middle meningeal artery and as you can see look how it's passing on this side of the bone let me remove the other vessels so that everything becomes clearer here you can see the pathway very clearly now and look how it's passing on this region this is your terion the terion is actually composed of multiple bones to show it a much better way I'll take it to the other side and here here we go let us still take it into there we go this region right here is the terrier you can appreciate the frontal bone a bit of the parietal bone the temporal bone the sphenoid bone and the one in front is your maxillary bone so this region right here is the terrier any direct injury here can rupture the middle meningeal artery which is on the inside and hence cause epidural hematoma so these were the two clinicals for related with the dura mater and its blood supplies let's move on to the subarachnoid matter the only thing worth mentioning regarding subarachnoid matter is that aside from being the second layer the space beneath the subarachnoid matter is known as the subarachnoid space there we go and in the subarachnoid space we have the passage of the cerebral spinal fluid I will uh, cover the flow of CSF and the ventricle system in the next topic for now let us look at the subarachnoid space now here we have the two layers of dura matter the subdural space here epidural spaces up above right over here we have the subarachnoid space and you can see these spider like extensions in this region this is the area which is filled with CSF now as I mentioned before the subarachnoid actually makes protrusions into the cerebellar veins or rather the superior sagittal sinus the CSF will then pass through this sub uh, these uh, arachnoid granulations and go into the blood flow this is how the CSF and the blood circulations communicate so the subarachnoid space is again more related with the flow of CSF which we'll look tomorrow one clinical however is important to note just like epidural hematoma subdural hematoma you can also have bleeding into the subarachnoid space but that is usually due to rupture of the Berry's aneurysm which is the enlargement of the circle of villus and that looks like so if I were to go back and over here to go back to the blood supply here we can see the circle of villus this is the underside of the skull if you remember the vertebral arteries the basilar arteries and here we have the middle meningeal posterior cerebral and the anterior cerebral so this right here is your circle of villus let's move the pins now one of these arteries is the posterior cerebral 
and it is this one which goes to the back side so any form of aneurysm which happens here an enlargement can potentially rupture and this usually happens in those patients who have hyperchronic hypertension the clinical presentation is a sudden headache severe headache and the patient usually complains that it is the worst headache of their lives and uh, it's extremely aggravating but this then bleeds into that subarachnoid space you will need to use an MRI to appreciate that much more clearly